Well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the State Department. I want to begin by thanking our friends and colleagues, Foreign Minister Cho, Defense Minister Kim, for their partnership, for their friendship, and for the very good discussions we had today. And as always, it's great to be with my friend, my colleague, Secretary Austin. In 2021, the two of us made our first foreign trip together, and we visited Seoul, uh, as well as Japan. This was our first overseas trip, uh, and the first two plus two of this administration. I just got back from uh, another trip to the Indo-Pacific a couple of weeks ago, which by our count was my 20th trip to the region since the start of this administration. But with the Republic of Korea, over the last three and, three and a half years, we've strengthened our alliance, we've modernized our alliance, an alliance that for seven decades has advanced peace, prosperity, and stability on the Korean Peninsula, in the Indo-Pacific, and increasingly around the world. Today, we had an opportunity to build on that progress and to also lay the groundwork to ensure that we continue delivering shared security and shared opportunity for our people in the years to come. Now, one of the things that we emphasized today was a reaffirmation of the United States' ironclad commitment to the ROK security, and that includes through extended deterrence. That's especially important in light of the ongoing provocations coming from North Korea, including another ICBM launch just yesterday. We condemn it in the strongest terms. Uh, the latest launch of many uh, and other provo provocative actions that it's taken. Flagrant violations all of multiple UN Security Council resolutions. All countries should be demanding that the DPRK cease these destabilizing actions. We are closely consulting with our partners and also with Japan. In fact, Foreign Minister Cho and I were on the phone early this morning with our Japanese counterpart, uh, and we will be focusing, uh, as always, on this in the, uh, in the days to come, uh, including the actions we'll take in response. All of this reinforces why we have to remain focused on maintaining peace and stability in the Indo-Pacific and on the Korean pen the Peninsula in particular, even as we work with European partners to respond to the DPRK's deepening security relationship with Russia. We now assess that there are some 10,000 North Korean soldiers in total in Russia. And the most <coughs> recent information indicates that as many as 8,000 of those North Korean forces have been deployed to the Kursk region. We've not yet seen these troops deploy into combat against Ukrainian forces, but we would expect that to happen in the coming days. Russia has been training DPRK soldiers in artillery, UAVs, basic infantry operations, including trench clearing, indicating that they fully intend to use these forces in frontline operations. Should these troops engage in combat or combat support operations against Ukraine, they would become legitimate military targets. Now, one of the reasons that Russia is turning to these North Korean troops uh, is that it's desperate. Putin has been throwing more and more Russians into a meat grinder of his own making in Ukraine. Now he's turning to North Korean troops, and that is a clear sign of weakness. Uh, Russia's been, been suffering some 1,200 casualties a day uh, in the East, more than at any other time during the war. And with the deployment of these North Korean troops to Russia and now to the front lines, this is the first time in a hundred years that Russia has invited foreign troops into its country. Our two sides today discussed a range of options in response, and we're clo closely coordinating with allies and partners, particularly our European partners. Uh, we're continuing to serve security assistance to Ukraine, the United States, and, and we'll announce more in the coming days. What we're also seeing underscores the indivisibility of security between the Indo-Pacific and Euro-Atlantic theaters, something that is clearer and clearer to all of our allies and partners in both Europe and the Indo-Pacific. It's reflected in South Korea's growing partnership with NATO, as well as its support for Ukraine, providing generators, humanitarian assistance. And we've discussed what more the Republic of Korea may do in the future. But in all of the conversations that I've been having with partners in both Europe and the Indo-Pacific, increasingly, we see a focus on 
um, the indivisibility of the security. With regard to China, we discussed the need to responsibly manage our competition with the People's Republic of China. We agreed that China should do more to curb the DPRK's provocative actions and to stop support for Russia's defense industrial base, which is helping to perpet uh, perpetuate the conflict and the aggression by Russia and Ukraine. In the face of uh, China's unlawful maritime claims in South China Sea, we remain committed to upholding freedom of navigation and freedom of overflight. We also underscored the importance of maintaining peace and stability across the Taiwan Strait. Even as we address these security challenges, we're also working together to expand our economic cooperation in ways that are having clear, direct, and powerful benefits for people in both of our countries. South Korea is now America's number one source of foreign direct investment. Uh, and this is really worth reflecting on because foreign direct investment may be the best measure of trust and confidence because you don't make these investments unless you believe in the future of the country that you're making the investments in. So it's a powerful gauge of the confidence that South Korea has in the United States. Uh, and more broadly, we are the number one recipient of foreign direct investment in the world. Again, a very powerful indicator of the way the world sees the United States. Thanks to the Chips and Science Act, uh, thanks to the uh, IRA, since 2021, Korea's companies have pledged to invest $140 billion in the United States, and that will help create some 100,000 jobs. And those jobs will be in the industries of the future. We're now uh, Korea's second largest investor. Together, we're advancing a shared economic vision for the Indo-Pacific and actually for the world. These goals are bolstered by growing trilateral cooperation with Japan, building on the historic Camp David Southern that President Biden convened and hosted. And we look forward to another trilateral summit at the earliest opportunity. I mentioned at the start that Korea is increasingly a powerful and consequential leader around the world, a global pivotal state. It hosted the Summit for Democracy in March. We look forward to Korea hosting APEC next year. And together, we are working to uphold the rules-based international order, the UN right now in the Security Council, where Korea is a member. Our alliance is continuing to do what it does best, which is deliver real results for our people, real benefits for Americans and for Koreans, and we're grateful for the strong bipartisan support that we enjoy in Congress for the alliance. President Yoon has said that the United States and Korea are marching together toward the future. Today, it's another reflection of the work that we're doing together, the fact that we are joined together in building a better, more secure, more prosperous future for all of our people. Thank you. Lloyd. Mr. Cho. Oh, Mr. Cho, you're right. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I would like to extend my sincere gratitude to Secretaries Blinken and Austin for co-hosting the sixth ROG U.S. Foreign and Defense Minister's meeting today and warmly welcoming the Korean delegation in this time of geopolitical transformation where regional and global security threats are ever increasing. Causing great security landscape, our two nations' foreign and defense ministers have come together and discussed joint responses, which was an extremely meaningful and timely endeavor. In today's meeting, we addressed the Korean Peninsula to strengthen the alliance as well as regional and global issues by having comprehensive and in-depth discussions based on which we agreed on a joint statement. The DPRK's troops dispatch included its military cooperation with Russia as a clear violation of the UN Security Council resolutions. Reaffirming this, we condemned it in the strongest language possible and called for an immediate stop to such dispatch and all other illegal military cooperation. Russia의 불법 
protections and nuclear and nuclear development were strongly condemned. Especially the DPRK's launch of a long-range missile yesterday was a grave violation of the U.S. Security Council resolutions and a threat to the Korean Peninsula and the world. To address the DPRK's habitual violations of the U.S. Security Council resolutions and ensure strong and effective enforcement of North Korean sanctions, we are resolved to continue our partnership with the international community to ensure its nuclear and missile development become not a strategic as said, our liability to the DPRK, active diplomatic endeavors will be made to this end, and also our protection will welcome the launch of a new mechanism to monitor the U.S.'s sanctions implementation against the DPRK, the multilateral sanctions monitoring team. We also had discussions on President Lee Song Yeo's August 15th initiation doctrine and for his vision of realizing a free, peaceful, and prosperous Korean Peninsula that can be unified, the U.S. reiterated its support. Last April, President Lee State visited to the U.S. and the historic Washington Declaration. Its follow-up measures have further strengthened its extended deterrence cooperation, based on which we also agreed to steadfastly develop a nuclear-based alliance. The U.S. reaffirmed its unwavering extended deterrence commitment to the ROC. Any nuclear attacks on the ROC by the DPRK will be met with a swift, overwhelming, and decisive response. We made it clear. We confirmed that the ROC U.S. Mutual Defense Treaty extends to space and cyberspace domains as well. Deterrence in these areas will be further bolstered, as we agreed. In addition, cooperation in defense science and technology, as well as defense industry, will be further reinforced to render the foundation of the alliance even stronger. To safeguard the rules-based international order in the Indo-Pacific, we agreed to continue working in close concert. We opposed any unilateral attempts to change the status quo in the region. Freedom of navigation and world flight is among the fundamental rights and obligations of the UNCLOS and international law. Establishing a maritime order where such is guaranteed is crucial, as we reaffirmed. We also reiterated our commitment to international solidarity and support for Ukraine. Now, in its 71st year, the Rogers Alliance, rooted in democracy, human rights, rule of law, and other core shared values, and unwaveringly trusted by our people, remains stronger than ever. Sharing this view, we agreed to further broaden and deepen the alliance by convening regular ROG U.S. Foreign and Defense Ministers meeting going forward. Such regularization of the 2 plus 2 meeting will ensure that the ROG U.S. Alliance as one of the most successful alliances engaged in more institutionalized and substantive cooperation. Thank you, Secretaries Blinken and Austin, once again. Minister Kim, Foreign Minister Cho, it's great to have you with us here in Washington. Today's meeting has once again demonstrated the importance of our ironclad alliance. Yesterday, Minister Kim and I discussed ways to strengthen and modernize our alliance's combined defense posture. And in today's 2 plus 2, we talked about evolving our alliance into a comprehensive global partnership. So let me touch on three key points. First, we agreed today to further enhance our interoperability and strengthen our extended deterrence. Our countries are deepening our nuclear and strategic planning efforts through the Nuclear Consultative Group. And we're increasing the regular deployments of U.S. strategic assets on the Korean Peninsula. We also affirm that attacks in space or cyberspace that clearly challenge the security of the alliance could lead us to invoke Article 3 of the Mutual Defense Treaty. So to improve our awareness of threats in the space and cyber domains, we're enhancing our interoperability and information sharing. Second. We're expanding the cooperation between our defense industrial bases. That includes the U.S. Navy certification of ROK shipyards to maintain, repair, and overhaul U.S. Navy ships. And that will help our alliance, help keep our alliance resilient. And it will help ensure that we have the capabilities to deter potential foes and, if necessary, prevail in conflict. Third, and finally, we're continuing to advance our defense ties with our regional allies and partners, especially the historic growth of trilateral security cooperation among Japan, 
the ROK, and the United States. Our robust partnerships, especially with Japan and the ROK, let us share information, assess threats, and craft thoughtful responses, just like last night when the DPRK conducted its latest irresponsible missile test. And across the Indo-Pacific, we're working to strengthen maritime security and to bolster interoperability through multilateral exercises. And we're helping to build up the capacity of our partner countries to tackle shared security challenges. We also recognize the profound links between Indo-Pacific security and Euro-Atlantic security. As you know, we now assess that North Korea has sent around 10,000 of its soldiers to train in eastern Russia. And as Secretary of State pointed out earlier, our most recent information indicates that about 8,000 of those DPRK soldiers are now in the Kursk Oblast. Now, we've not yet seen these soldiers deploy in co into combat against Ukraine's forces, but we expect that these North Korean soldiers will join the fight against Ukraine in the coming days. Our assessment is that Putin's forces have trained these North Korean soldiers in artillery operations, UAV operations, and basic infantry operations, including trench clearing. The Kremlin has also provided these DPRK troops with Russian uniforms and equipment. And all of that strongly indicates that Russia intends to use these foreign forces in frontline operations in its war of choice against Ukraine. And make no mistake, if these North Korean troops engage in combat or combat support operations against Ukraine, they would make themselves legitimate military targets. So we are consulting closely with our allies and partners in other countries in the region on these reckless developments and on our response. As I discussed last week in Kyiv, Ukraine's military continues to perform admirably on the battlefield, and Putin's forces have suffered serious losses. In recent months, Ukrainian forces have caused more than 1,200 Russian casualties per day, more than at, than at any other time during Putin's war. And by tin cupping to North Korea for manpower, Putin is showing the world another clear sign of weakness. The Kremlin's North Korean gambit just underscores how badly Putin's war has gone and how much trouble he's in. This is the first time in more than a century that Russia has welcomed foreign troops onto its own soil. As Secretary Blinken noted, a permanent member of the UN Security Council is violating Security Council resolutions that it agreed to. So at the direction of the President, the United States will continue to surge security assistance to Ukraine, and so will our allies and partners in the Ukraine Defense Contact Group. That includes artillery and air defense, armored vehicles, munitions, and other crucial capabilities. The United States will announce additional security assistance for Ukraine in the coming days. And in our meetings yesterday and today, we discussed with our ROK allies how we're, doing, how we're going to work together with our allies and partners to respond to this dangerous and destabilizing escalation. We're also closely tracking other bullying by the DPRK, Russia, and the People's Republic of China. And that's why the United States and the ROK are working so closely with our partners to stand up to coercive destabilizing actions in both the Indo-Pacific and the Euro-Atlantic. Our work together is central to ensuring peace and stability and to enhancing deterrence. Foreign Minister Cho and Minister Kim, thanks for your leadership and your commitment to this proud alliance. Minister Kim, over to you. Good afternoon. I am the Minister of National Defense of the Republic of Korea. First, I'd like to thank Secretary of State Blinken and Secretary of Defense Austin for hosting the raucous Foreign and Defense Ministerial and for your warm reception of the Korean delegation. 
International community today is faced with complex challenges which threaten peace and security, and we are in the most stern security environment since the Cold War. It is at this time that the raucous foreign and defense ministers have gathered together to discuss raucous alliance development and various issues on regional peace and security, which is very timely and significant. At the meeting, we agreed that the raucous alliance is the core pillar of peace, security and prosperity of the Korean Peninsula and the Indo-Pacific region, and we agreed to strengthen cooperation as global comprehensive strategic alliance. On North Korea's ICBM launch yesterday, we denounced this with one voice and urged North Korea to abide by the UN Security Council resolutions. Also, on the escalating North Korean nuclear and missile threats, we agreed to continuously strengthen cooperation on deterrence and response. On North Korea's deployment of troops to Russia and illegal military cooperation with Russia, we denounced this with strong words and strongly urged the immediate withdrawal of North Korean troops. We have completed the joint guidelines in July last July, and thus uplifting the Rockus Alliance into a nuclear-based alliance in name and substance. We reconfirmed our common goal of the complete denuclearization of North Korea, and based on historic joint guidelines, we agreed to continuously strengthen the implementation of extended deterrence. The U.S. reconfirmed the strong commitment to two use full scope military capabilities to provide extended deterrence to the Republic of Korea. We confirmed that the scope of the Mutual Defense Treaty applies to space and cyber domains and agreed to strengthen cooperation in space and cyber domains. To respond to new challenges, including global supply chain crises and advanced technology competition, we concurred that we need to evolve into a science and technology alliance and agreed to strengthen cooperation in defense industry and defense science and technology. We concurred on the importance of upholding rules-based international order in the region and on enhancing cooperation with other value-sharing countries. In particular, we agreed to strengthen rock us japan security cooperation and based on our indo-pacific strategies we agreed to expand cooperation with the asean and pacific island nations and in new areas of cooperation such as AUKUS pillar 2 we have agreed to create synergy the meeting today we assess is a cornerstone for developing the rockus alliance into a global comprehensive strategic alliance and we will closely cooperate for peace, security, and prosperity on the Korean Peninsula and in the region. We go together. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, my first question is for the four of you. You discussed the need for Beijing to do more to rein in North Korea's aggression, but so far, China has been largely silent on North Korea's deployment of troops to help Russia's war effort. What do you make of this silence? Uh, what do you want to see? What specific steps would you like to see happen next? And is now the time for South Korea to supply offensive arms to Ukraine? And then over to the Middle East, if I may, Secretary Austin, Secretary Blinken, do you see a Lebanon ceasefire deal coming together? Is that on the horizon? And then in Gaza, the U.S. has been pushing Israel for answers on that devastating strike in Bet Lahia for days now to no avail. Also, the letter you sent to the Israeli government called for the creation of a new channel on civilian harm incidents by the end of this month. So far, it doesn't appear that has happened. Has anything changed on either of those fronts? And if not, how do you justify continuing to arm a foreign power that won't cooperate? Any more? <laughs> um, I'm happy to start. As we said, I think uh, each of us, and as we uh, say collectively, uh, we believe that 
the entire world should be insisting and demanding that the DPRK cease its provocative actions, both in terms of the repeated missile launches in violation of U.N. Security Council resolutions, and now also uh, providing its troops for uh, Russia's use in this war of aggression uh, against Ukraine. And when it comes to China, as a member of the United Nations Security Council, uh, we would and should expect no less. Uh, and we've had communications with, uh, with China. In fact, we had a robust conversation uh, just this week. And I think they know well the concerns that we have and the expectations that, both in word and deed, they'll use the influence that they have to work to curb these activities. So we'll see if they take action. But I think this is a demand signal that's coming not just from us, uh, but from countries around the world that see what the DPRK is doing, both in the uh, immediate region on the Korean Peninsula, but also what it's doing uh, in, um, uh, in Europe. Uh, now, it's also very important to note that this is a two-way street between DPRK and Russia. We're seeing what uh, DPRK is providing to Russia in terms of troops. We're very focused on and concerned about what Russia might be doing in order to enhance the DPRK's capacities, its military capacity. That, too, should be of real concern to China because it's profoundly destabilizing uh, in the region. Um, on Lebanon, um, let me just say that we are working very hard and making progress on reaching understandings of what would be required for the effective implementation of UN Security Council Resolution 1701. This would be the basis of a diplomatic resolution uh, to the crisis. It's important to, uh, to, to make sure that we have clarity, uh, both from Lebanon and from Israel, about what would be required under 1701 to get its effective implementation. The withdrawal of Hezbollah forces uh, from the border, the deployment of the Lebanese armed forces, the authorities uh, under which they'd be acting, uh, an appropriate enforcement mechanism. And I can tell you that uh, based on my recent trip to the region, the work that's ongoing right now, we have made good progress um, on those understandings. We still have more work to do, but that's what's necessary uh, to get us to a diplomatic resolution, including through a ceasefire. Uh, and with regard to Gaza, uh, I can tell you a, a couple of things. First, um, both of us and our teams are tracking very carefully Israel's responsibilities to meet the letter uh, of, uh, of the law as we sent it uh, jointly uh, to our Israeli counterparts with regard to the provision of humanitarian assistance. Uh, and there's been uh, real progress, but insufficient. And we're working on a daily basis to make sure that Israel does what it must do to uh, ensure that this assistance gets to people who need it inside of uh, Gaza. It's not enough to get trucks to Gaza. It's vital that uh, what they bring with them can get distributed effectively inside of Gaza. And one other thing on this very quickly. One of the things that has been successful in recent uh, months was the polio vaccination campaign for hundreds of thousands of Palestinian children in Gaza. But in order for that campaign to be concluded, we have to complete a second round of vaccinations. And these vaccinations have to happen within a certain period of time from the first round of vaccinations. It is urgent that this be completed uh, in the days ahead, and we're looking to uh, Israel to facilitate that, uh, that action. Uh, and then finally, sorry for going on so long, uh, for many months Israel's made clear that the strategic objectives that it had in Gaza in making sure that October 7th and the horrors of October 7th could never happen again or the effective dismantlement of Hamas's military capacity, its organized military capacity, and the elimination of the leaders who are responsible for October 7th. So both of those goals have been achieved. And the focus now must be on ending the war and, in the meanwhile, making sure that people who need the assistance uh, for food, for medicine, uh, and other basic uh, humanitarian needs get the assistance that they need. So, with respect to uh, the PRC um, in, in uh, this latest development with DPRK troops uh, in, uh, in Russia, you know, we're speaking to countries uh, throughout the region uh, about this alarming uh, development, uh, and that includes, as Tony pointed out, uh, to, uh, it includes the PRC. 
And I would refer you to the PRC for their position. But if China is serious about its desire for de-escalation, it should be asking Russia some hard questions at this point, and whether, whether it intends to, uh, to broaden this conflict by this kind of behavior. Uh, and so we'll continue to work with, uh, with allies and partners uh, and, uh, and make sure that uh, you know, we're, we're doing the right things in terms of um, being prepared to move to the next stage in terms of holding uh, DPRK uh, to task. Um, regarding activities in, uh, in the Middle East, um, you know, I talk to my counterpart, Minister Gallant, uh, routinely. I'll talk to him today, this afternoon. And every time I talk to him, I emphasize the need to protect civilians in the battle space and the need to provide uh, humanitarian assistance to, um, to the people in Gaza. And as Tony pointed out, uh, they have made some progress uh, recently. We want to see them uh, do much more, and we'll continue to emphasize that as we engage in the future. And uh, again, uh, we're hopeful that uh, we can uh, we we see things. We will see things uh, transition in Lebanon uh, in a not too distant future. I think there's an opportunity for that to happen. Uh, but uh, you know, it's it's left to be seen when that will, will happen, but we'll continue to press to make sure that uh, it happens sooner versus later. 네, 지금 최근에 진전 상황에 대한 중국의 입장에 대해서 uh, regarding uh, China stance on the recent developments and what kind of measures that we will be asking for towards China and concerning the military capacity of the DPRK and the troop Patch to Russia, but China has been reticent about uh, making its position, position known, but I believe that uh, it is finding it very uncomfortable, the whole situation. Starting from last spring, because we know that there are things that China can do, we have been engaging in high-level talks and communication with China so that uh, we can make relevant cooperation. So we'll continue to do so going forward, and we will be having many contacts and interactions with the PRC and utilizing those occasions. So we will relay our, our concerns and thoughts to the Depending on the developments uh, in military co cooperation between the DPRK and Russia, relevant measures, corresponding measures will be taken accordingly. We need to see the level of involvement of the DPRK forces in Russia. And we also need to watch what kind of quid pro quo the DPRK will be receiving from Russia. So we'll have to watch that before making a decision as to the weapons support that we will be providing to Ukraine. So we're currently we're not in a position to share the specifics. So the three earlier ministers have already mentioned much, but I'd like to just add one point. On the silence of the PRC, China still continues to be silent. I think the more clear assessment is that it is watching and waiting. And if the situation worsens, at one point, China either as a mediator or any other role may be intervening. So when the situation worsens, so there will be a point when the interests of China will be violated, and it is at that point that China will begin to play a certain role. For the next question, Sang Ho Song with Yonhap News Agency. Thank you. Uh, my first question is for Minister Kim and Secretary Austin. Uh, yesterday, North Korea launched an ICBM. Do you assess that um, there was any Russian technological support vis-a-vis -vis the latest, latest uh, ICBM launch? Uh, regarding uh, the SCM statement yesterday, uh, the statement said that Minister and Secretary decided to include a uh, North Korean nuclear attack scenario in future combined exercises. Does that require any uh, revision or update of uh, ROC U.S. wartime operational um, plans? And, and when will that happen? Would that uh, be applied to combined exercises in coming years or next year? Can you give us some clarity on the time frame? 
And, and my second question is for um, Secretary Blinken and Minister Cho. Uh, can you tell us what specific steps South Korea and the United States are considering taking beyond just public condemnation um, if uh, North Korean troops' actual entry into combat is confirmed? Thank you. So, so the first question was on the ICBM, and, and can you? It, it. Do you have any assessment indicating that there was any Russian technological support uh, regarding the ICM, ICBM well, I, launch this, this week? Thank you. At this point, uh, it's, it's uh, very early uh, in, uh, in our assessment phase, and we don't see uh, any indication at this point that there was uh, Russian involvement. But again, we'll continue to work with our partners and, and our allies in the, in the region to, to analyze this. But, but again, let me emphasize the uh, uh, how irresponsible this behavior is, and uh, you know we call upon the DPR, DPRK to to cease and desist. Uh, it's potentially destabilizing, and and again, uh, it violates uh, the UN uh, secure uh, UN sanctions. So, uh, but but at, to answer your question specifically, I don't see uh, any uh, any Russian involvement. And your second question was. Uh, the second question is regarding the SCM statement yesterday. The statement said that the minister and um, Secretary Austin decided to include North Korean nuclear attack scenario and a future combined exercises between South Korea and the U.S. militaries. So um, I'm wondering if that requires a revision of wartime operational plans between South Korea and the United States, and when will that happen? If that's happening maybe next year or coming years, do you have any uh, time frame for that? Thank you. Well, certainly uh, I won't. Uh, gives, uh, uh, provide specifics about the contents of our planning, but uh, I would just say that we are constantly uh, planning and upgrading our plans uh, and, and working to make sure that, uh, that we are ready to, to fight tonight if, that, uh, if it comes to that. But again, the fact that we continue to, to uh, increase our interoperability, uh, I think uh, that reassures uh, our allies and partners in the region, and it also uh, serves as a deterrent against anyone who would uh, who would want to uh, do the unthinkable and try to take on this this great alliance. Firstly, on the first question. On North Korea's ICBM launch, was there a technical support from Russia? That has not been confirmed at the moment. And what we predict is that uh, there is no evidence that Russian technology support was provided. Secondly, so combined exercises based on North Korean nuclear uh, capabilities. In all of the operational plans, it is based on strategy, and based on the strategy, strategic plan implementation happens, and so that is how we proceed with our exercises, and it will be implemented as soon as possible. So I think that is as far as I can say. Uh, other than the public condemnation between our two nations, what specific actions are we considering? That was the question. At this point, strategic communication towards the international community, especially tailoring our messages uh, to different groups of members of the international community and a coordination of independent sanctions are on our minds and we will consider the full rest of possible scenarios for making considerations as to the options to take regarding the specific measures and actions to be taken, we'll have to see the specifics of military cooperation between the DPRK and Russia. Once that's confirmed, we will take actions accordingly. Yeah, and I can only uh, reinforce what uh, the foreign minister said. We will, of course, consult closely with uh, allies and partners. We see North Korean troops enter into combat. Uh, as both Lloyd and I have said, that makes them legitimate military targets. Uh, but we'll be consulting with uh, allies and partners on any additional steps and any additional measures 
uh, we may choose to take for our part for the United States. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, you'll be seeing additional security assistance heading in the direction of Ukraine uh, very soon to be announced uh, in, the, in the coming days. Uh, and throughout uh, these months, uh, we will be with more than 50 countries uh, continuing to strengthen uh, and build support for Ukraine's defense uh, with everything that it needs to effectively uh, defend itself, as well as continuing to uh, put pressure uh, on Russia uh, and to deal uh, in many other ways with the, uh, with the ongoing aggression. For the next question, Noah Robertson with Defense. The microphone is not on. Can you hear me? Did you hear the question? Or should I repeat I it? No, I got it. Thanks. Perfect. Thank you. And to both Secretary Austin and Secretary Blinken. I wanted to know if you could describe the progress that you've seen in humanitarian aid and whether you believe with Gaza that Israel is on track to reach a sufficient level for your satisfaction, and if you could expand specifically on what channel that the U.S. has used to communicate with China about the DPRK's um, actions in Russia. Um, to Secretary Austin specifically, I wanted to know, now that we have seen these 8,000 DPRK troops deploy toward Kursk, whether you think it's possible for Ukraine to hold on to its territory there, or whether it will have to try to consolidate its defenses given the losses in the east. And then if I could venture one more specifically to Minister Kim, um, could you specify the number of containers that the DPRK has provided to Russia during the conflict as it grows its cooperation militarily? Thank you. Thank you. Well, of course, I'll let Israel speak for itself, but I think uh, it actually largely has. Uh, I said, it's made clear repeatedly and publicly that the critical objectives that it had for making sure that October 7th could never happen again were the elimination of Hamas's organized military uh, capacity, uh, as well as bringing to justice uh, those who were responsible for perpetrating October 7th, and notably Mr. Sinwar. Well, the latter is demonstrably uh, done, uh, and the Israelis themselves have said and said publicly uh, that they have dismantled Hamas's military capacity. So on that basis, and these are their stated objectives, uh, those objectives having been achieved at great cost in the lives of children, women, men, Palestinians caught in this crossfire of Hamas's initiation and making, well, this would be the time to move to end the war. Um, in terms of progress on the humanitarian aid, look, uh, the, the, the letter that uh, Lloyd and I sent, which is now uh, in the public domain, even though that was not the intent, lays out uh, a number of things that we expect to see them do. And I can tell you that uh, as you go down the list, there are a number of them, uh, a number of these steps have been taken, including, for example, uh, reviving crossings that had been uh, dormant, uh, initiating and uh, opening a new crossing into Gaza. Uh, some additional measures. Some are in train. Uh, others we've not yet seen. Uh, and so we're tracking this uh, between us, between our teams, with the Israelis and um, those who are working on the humanitarian response every single day. Uh, I know, as the Secretary said, he'll be speaking to um, Defense Minister Gallant, I believe, later today. Uh, and I'm sure that will, that will come up. So we're very focused on making sure that uh, the steps that we outlined in the letter are actually taken and implemented and sustained. Because what we've seen in the past is this. Uh, we've seen Israel uh, take important steps, for example, this spring, also in response to um, what the United States said was necessary to improve the humanitarian situation for people in Gaza. And we saw real, real progress, and then we saw it diminish and, and then tail off, uh, which is one of the reasons we felt it was so imperative to, uh, to write to our counterparts and to see action uh, taken on this. In terms of our uh, engagement with China, I mentioned earlier that we had uh, a robust engagement uh, just this week, and what I can tell you is that happens between senior officials in, in our government, including the State Department, and, uh, and the Chinese government. 
Uh, regarding the progress um, with respect to the delivery of humanitarian assistance, I agree with what Tony has said. Uh, we are seeing progress, and, uh, and we'll continue to watch this uh, on a daily basis, and I'll continue to engage uh, my counterpart and, and, and encourage him to, uh, to pick up the pace. Uh, you know, more crossings uh, be, being opened, uh, more uh, humanitarian assistance going in. We just got to make sure that uh, they increase it even more. Uh, the question, the other question you had for me was that uh, based upon the 10,000 troops from a DPRK that have entered the, the, uh, the battle space, is it possible for uh, Ukraine to hold on to Kursk? Uh, the answer is yes. And, and, you know, if you take a look at, you know, what, what I said earlier in terms of the numbers of casualties that Russia is, uh, is suffering on a daily basis, some 1,250 or so casualties per day, uh, you do the math on a, on a, on a given month, that's, those are pretty big numbers. And so the number 10,000 uh, kind of pales in comparison to those kinds of casualties. So uh, this 10,000 won't, won't come close to replacing the numbers that the, the Russians have lost. Uh, and, uh, and again, I think they're at a point now that if they've got to go uh, seeking for assistance uh, to a country like the DPRK, then I think, uh, I think they have some problems. But yes, I do believe that they can, they can hold on to the territory if they choose to do that. They, they do have options. They can do a number of things. But if they choose to do that, they can hold it. And just before turning to my colleague, there's one thing I want to make sure that I emphasize as well, because I'd be remiss if I didn't say it. Of course, the other absolute requirement for this war to come to an end is for the hostages to come home. And that includes the seven Americans. So we're working on that every single day, but that is absolutely necessary and, with every passing day, increasingly urgent. Yeah. On North Korea's munition support to Russia, it will be in the hundreds of thousands. So it's not one million or two million, but it's close to tens of millions of munitions. And missiles will be about 1,000. Over 1,000 missiles have been provided. And for the final question, Min Sok Lee with Chosun Yilbo. Thank you. My first question is to Secretary Austin. Has there been any uh, new U.S. intelligence or assessment of what Russia might offer North Korea in exchange for deploying over 10,000 troops, whether in the form of military aid, advanced weapons technology, or economic support? And to Secretary Blinken, as DPRK's nuclear and missile programs have become increasingly advanced, U.S. officials have been mentioning the uh, interim steps to engage with North Korea, which raised some speculations about whether the U.S. is poised to employ a uh, policy shift. There was no phrase denuclearization in the joint statement released yesterday FT, after the SCM. So uh, is the U.S. moving the focus of the, its diplomacy from the pursuit of complete denuclearization of the North, Korean, uh, North Korea to one of deterrence? Thanks. Next, my question is for Minister Kim Jong Un and Kim Jong Un. Minister Kim yesterday, you talked about the enhancement of ICBM and there's a possibility that North Korea has been advancing technology from Russia. And so, do you have any signs that this is actually happening? And if this concern is visualized, comes to fruition, what will the Korean government do as a response? And what are the preventive measures that that we can take. In terms of what uh, the DPRK may be getting in return for its provision of 10,000 troops, uh, we, that's unknown at this point. But I, as you look at things, you would guess that uh, technology would be at the top of the list. And, uh, and that's, again, one of those things that could be and will be destabilizing, depending on what kind of technology we're talking about. Financial assistance, and you can go down the list. Uh, and certainly, uh, DPRK stands a chance of, uh, of gaining in this, uh, in this exchange here. This is something that we're going to have to continue to watch very, very closely. 
it will embolden their potentially embolden them to do more of the kinds of things that uh, that we've seen them do here recently, especially the kinds of things that we saw last, yesterday with the launch of an ICBM. Uh, and our policy uh, remains what it has been and will remain, which is the complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. 네. On Russian technology transfer to North Korea, as of yet, well, nothing has been confirmed. It has not been confirmed as a fact, but we are just making predictions about the possibility. However, if there will be a transfer of Russian technology to uh, North Korea, we can overcome that uh, through the advanced technology that the alliance has. To deter such a situation, I believe uh, our efforts in that regard is most important. In collaboration with the international community, we are engaged in strategic communication and coordinating independent sanctions. While well, these activities have exactly that situation, a deterrence of that situation in mind as the top priority. And once uh, that's done, as to what kind of actions to be taken, I will have to repeat the principle that I've already told you about. Thank you. Thank you all.